Hello, everybody. This is Jake Wynn, Director of Interpretation at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. I'm going to be your host for this afternoon's program about Major Jonathan Letterman, one of the most important figures of the American Civil War that chances are, if you're following us here on the National Museum of Civil War Medicine's Facebook page, you probably have heard of before. But if you haven't, Jonathan Letterman is one of the most important medical innovators of the American Civil War. He participated in the conflict as a member of the United States Army, which he served in the decade before the Civil War uh, with that entity. Uh, and he is going to oversee some of the most major sweeping medical changes that are going to take place during the Civil War uh, within the U.S. Army's most famous army in the conflict. That is the Army of the Potomac, the one fighting in the Eastern Theater, doing most of its fighting between Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania during the course of the Civil War. So this, this afternoon's program is going to look at who this figure was, who Jonathan Letterman was, and why he is really important to the story of Civil War medicine, and why his legacy is still really important for us today. Before we get to that, I do want to uh, go through a bit of a brief kind of introduction that we typically do at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Again, for those of you, it's about 50 of you here watching right now, which is fantastic. But for those of you who've been here before, you'll, you'll know this. Uh, you've heard this before. We've been doing these videos on our Facebook page and then throwing them up onto YouTube since March. We do them a couple times a week, focusing on different topics. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about Dr. Jonathan Letterman. We've talked about things like triage and disease in the Civil War, and we've interviewed incredible historians and public historians uh, who deal with the story of Civil War medical care. These videos uh, originally were taking the place of us being open to the public. Uh, back during the heart of the pandemic, when uh, shutdowns were the norm, we were doing these videos in lieu of being open to the public. Now we are doing them in combination with being open uh, to the public. The National Museum of Civil War Medicine is located in Frederick, Maryland. Uh, that is now open on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. You can go and visit, walk in. And it is open Monday through Thursday for appointments. So you can go to civilwarmed.org, find that website in the comment section as well. And you can go and you can book an appointment to come and visit the museum. I am at our DC location, which is actually typically where I am stationed. Uh, we have not been open here at the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum since March. I am very excited to say that as of Wednesday, September 16th, we are going to be opening for appointments here in Washington, D.C. at this site. So you can go to civilwarmed.org or clarabartonmuseum.org and you can find information about how you can book an appointment to come and visit the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum. You can see part of the exhibits on the ground floor behind me here. And uh, if you would like to come and visit our locations and you want to get in for, uh, uh, for free and have free access, you can become a member of the museum. Uh, you can become a member and uh, go to our website. So you can also find a, a link in the comments that'll come in about how you can join up and become a member of the museum. The, you get lots of great perks like annual mem annual visitor uh, ship to these sites. You can come and visit these sites for free uh, anytime you want. And uh, um, along with other great perks as well. But I would definitely say that the, the best thing about the membership is you're supporting content like this. You're supporting videos, uh, us coming right to you. You don't even have to come get off your couch, get away from your computer screen. You can uh, learn a little bit about Civil War medical history right at home. And your membership or donation would support these videos. Allows us to do what we do here at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum, and the Pry House Field Hospital Museum out on Antietam National Battlefield. Uh, for those of you who have made, may have just joined, uh, my name is Jake Wynn. I am Director of Interpretation at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine and Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum. I see we have quite a number of people tuning in. I'm just going to take a quick gander down the uh, comments section. Uh, one of the great things about these videos is there is a lively discussion going on. Uh, always encourage that. Uh, get to know each other. Talk with each other. Let us know where you're watching from. Got folks watching from New Hampshire, San Diego. Uh, Robert's rallying around the flag as he always does in quarantine. Uh, Florida, Michigan, Concord, North Carolina, Urbana, Illinois, Virginia. 
uh, Fort Pierce, Florida, uh, the wilderness, uh, and uh, where else we got? More Floridas, Maryland, people saying hello. It is great to chat with you all today, and I'm so excited to, uh, to have you all here. Um, so, like I said at the very introduction, we are going to be uh, we are going to be doing a presentation today about Dr. Jonathan Letterman. Um, so, as part of this presentation, I'm going to have a, a series of slides here. So, I'm not always going to be able to see the comments. So, uh, if you do have a question in there, I'm going to do my best to to get to those. We're going to take a half time break about halfway through this, so we can answer any questions you might have uh, along the way. Um, but going to start and kick over to sh my share screen. I'm always really bad at this, so uh, bear with me um, as I get our other screen up. Uh, and thank you all so much for tuning in with us today and for all of our videos. We really appreciate your support. All right, there we go. Now, I hope all of you can see that. Let me pull, oop, let me pull that up. There we go. All right, so we are going to be talking today about Jonathan Letterman, one of my favorite figures from the American Civil War. We're gonna be talking about the crucial role that he played during the Civil War. He is going to be one of the, the figures that is gonna be driving advances in battlefield medicine within the US Army during the conflict. And as I mentioned in the introduction as well, his influence is gonna be felt years, decades, a century and a half even after the war is over, we are still living in the shadow of what Letterman did uh, and his colleagues did during the Civil War. Uh, the plan that he is going to be most known for is what's known today as the Letterman Plan. Uh, he is going to perfect battlefield evacuation using some of the technologies that were available to him during the 19th century. This can be railroads, steamships, uh, new ambulances that are going to be developed during the Civil War. And his plan is going to ensure that soldiers in the U.S. Army are going to be cared for very quickly after they're wounded. There's going to be men who are going to be detailed to pick them up, bring them back to uh, first aid, then on to field hospitals, then back to transit hospitals while they're being moved, uh, in many cases dozens if not hundreds of miles, to uh, established military hospitals in the major cities of the North. Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, all are going to have military hospitals during the war. The Letterman plan is going to get the, these wounded soldiers to those hospitals. He's also going to establish the first ambulance corps in the history of the United States Army. He's going to professionalize the medical service within specifically the Army of the Potomac. And he leaves that legacy that's going to be stretched. You can draw a direct line. This is something that's really important to us at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine is he draws a direct line. We can draw a direct line between Jonathan Letterman and the innovations that took place during the Civil War and our world today, uh, whether that is in things like triage, organized evacuation systems, uh, ambulance services, uh, and you know, professionalized medicine. He is very much in a, a part of the U.S. Army, part of the medical department that is very focused on ensuring that scientific evidence-based medicine becomes a standard part of the U.S. Army's practices. And that is going to distill down in the years after the Civil War to the rest of American healthcare. Uh, so in many ways, Letterman is part of this system that, is, that gives us a modern healthcare system. Uh, it's one of the important parts of, of looking at the, the Civil War from the medical aspect. There's a great quote here, and for those of you who've been to the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, or even maybe have heard me give portions of this lecture before, you're going to be probably familiar with this quote, but I love this. Uh, it's from uh, Major General Paul Hawley, who was a chief surgeon, uh, in, he was the chief surgeon uh, in the European theater of the Second World War. And he looked back to Letterman and what Letterman did during the Civil War to try to understand his own experience uh, in this massive worldwide conflict in the 1930s and 1940s. And he looked at Jonathan Letterman and what he did during the Civil War. And this is what he had to say. This is uh, Major General Paul Hawley says, quote, I often wondered whether had I been confronted with the primitive system which Letterman fell heir to at the beginning of the Civil War, I could have developed as good an organization as he did. I doubt it. There, is not, there was not a day during World War II that I did not thank God for Jonathan Letterman. Love that quote, it's a fantastic one. Uh, so let's peel back these layers. Let's take a look at who Jonathan Letterman was, 
uh, and why he is so important. So first of all, we'll take a look at the man himself. Uh, this is Jonathan Letterman. I am always very jealous of his incredible head of hair. That is quite the uh, quite the, the the rooster thing he's got going on there. Uh, this is a photo taken in 1862. Uh, so this afternoon, we're going to look at Jonathan Letterman's service during the Civil War through the lens of four important words. Uh, we're going to look at these words specifically. Uh, they're valuable to any leader, but they're going to be particularly valuable to Jonathan Letterman. And these are going to be those words, collaboration, innovation, communication, and adaptation. And these are going to be four themes that are going to crop up numerous times this afternoon as we're talking about Letterman. And I want us to be thinking about this question, these two questions. Uh, how did Jonathan Letterman change battlefield medicine? And ultimately, why does this still matter today? So as we're going through, if you have a background in medicine or, or just an interest in Civil War history or, or medical history, I want you to be thinking about this. As we're going through this presentation, you're going to find that numerous aspects of what Letterman and his team experienced during the Civil War has relevance today. Uh, when I originally created this presentation, which was in the uh, autumn of 2019, I could not have imagined that we would be experiencing a global pandemic just a few months after I created this, uh, but there are going to be connections that you're going to see throughout this presentation that tie into themes and issues we are still facing today in the United States of America and around the world when it comes to dealing with mass casualty incidents, when it comes to dealing with a large scale medical crisis. Letterman and medical doctors of that time faced challenges that in many ways are very similar to what we're facing today. So I want us to be thinking about these four terms, these four themes, as we are going through uh, this afternoon's program. And so as we're going through, uh, you know, feel free to comment, jump into the comments, start a discussion. The more comments, the better uh, when it comes to uh, these videos. It allows more people to join in the conversation. You can also like and share this video that will help more people uh, to see this program this afternoon. So let's go back to the beginning. We have Letterman here. You've seen him with his great head of hair. Uh, you've seen the four terms we are going to be thinking about as we're going through. And I've given you your questions uh, to, to be thinking about as we're going through. So let's go find out a little bit about Jonathan Letterman, the man, who he was, where he came from, what his inspirations and his education taught him. So to start, we're gonna go to Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is going to be a town where Jonathan Letterman was born on December 11th, 1824. His father was a local doctor, a renowned local doctor in southwestern Pennsylvania. So if you want to know where Cannonsburg is, go to the very southwest corner of Pennsylvania, and that's where, you're, where you'll find it, um, south and west of Pittsburgh. In the fall of 1842, Letterman entered Jefferson College in Cannonsburg as a freshman. Uh, this is now Washington and Jefferson College. In 1845, he graduated and, uh, from Washington and Jefferson College and headed east across the state of Pennsylvania to the southeastern corner uh, to a medical school that actually had ties uh, to Jefferson College at Cannonsburg. He is going to head off to Philadelphia and he's going here. In 1845, he's going to begin studies at Jefferson Medical College. So Philadelphia was the beckoning to those who wanted to be medical doctors in the United States in this time period. If you wanted to go and become a professional and a, be considered a fine doctor in this period in American history, you went through Philadelphia. It had a number of renowned medical institutions. Among them was Jefferson Medical College. Um, Jefferson was founded in 1825 by Dr. George McClellan. You can see him up in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. That name should sound familiar uh, to many of you, I'm sure. Uh, the school uh, was founded by George Brinton McClellan's father. So the gentleman you're looking up here uh, is the father of George McClellan that is going to serve in the Civil War and actually be Jonathan Letterman's boss during the conflict. We'll get to that in just a bit. Uh, the school was founded as the medical department of Jefferson College in Cannonsburg. So there's actually a direct connection between Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia and Jefferson College in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania. Even though they're clear across the states, opposite corners, 
very difficult to get between those two corners in the 1820s when the school is founded, but there is a connection between these two institutions. McClellan was a fantastic doctor and teacher, and he inspired the admiration of his students. They loved him as a professor uh, and as the head of the school. Um, but by the late 1830s, um, the school was in, was in trouble. Uh, not doing great, not luring a lot of students. Again, Philadelphia is very popular as a medical school site. Uh, there are other medical schools in the area. Uh, and ultimately, McClellan and all the other staff in the, then, at the end of the 1830s are going to be fired uh, in 1839 specifically. Uh, new staff is going to be brought in. And they're going to have some very highly respected names who are going to be uh, the teachers for Jonathan Letterman and many of his uh, classmates, who quite a, quite a number of them are going to participate in the conflict as Civil War surgeons, in fact, on either side of the conflict, both Union and Confederate. Uh, two of, of these teachers have last names that you may be familiar with. Uh, one of them is uh, Dr. Charles Meggs. He was a well-known obstetrician, uh, and he was father to Montgomery Meggs. So you may have know of the name Montgomery Meggs, quartermaster of the U.S. Army during the Civil War, uh, renowned kind of architect and engineer uh, responsible for Arlington National Cemetery. Well, his father uh, was a professor at Jefferson Medical College and taught a young uh, up-and-coming medical student named Jonathan Letterman. The other uh, doctor with a famous name that you would find teaching at Jefferson Medical College in the 1840s was Dr. Thomas Mutter. Uh, he taught surgery, uh, used specimens from the medical collection that he was curating himself, uh, and that is the medical collection that went on to become the Mütter Museum in Philadelphia, which I highly, highly recommend. So this is where Letterman's going to get his medical education, uh, in these hallowed halls in Philadelphia. Uh, medical education at that time was very cursory uh, compared to modern courses of study in medicine. Uh, no written examinations, uh, virtually all oral tests, um, very little hands-on experience for these medical students. Uh, medical school lasted anywhere between 18 months and two years. Um, and that is going to be uh, the, the case for, for many doctors, many up and coming doctors in the, uh, in the early 19th century. So Letterman's not getting an experience that's very different than many of the other medical doctors, even though Philadelphia and Jefferson Medical College specifically are considered a, a fine institution. Uh, ultimately, uh, Letterman is going to be taking classes. He's also going to apprentice in Philadelphia uh, and in the Philadelphia area. So he is going to get some hands on knowledge. He's ultimately going to graduate. Uh, in 1849, after four years of classes and uh, that apprenticeship. So he's actually having a longer course of study than is typically normal for doctors of this era. Uh, this is a critical moment in American medical history, though, when Letterman is learning and cutting his teeth as a medical student. Um, this is a, an era when there are lots of competing ideas about what medicine actually is. Uh, are we going back to the classics? Are we going back to the heroic age? Uh, the ideas of humors in the body and we need to, to bleed people. We need to get these substances out of the body. Or are we moving more in a new age? Uh, we are in the industrial revolution in America at this time. Are we gonna err on the side of science? Are we gonna to move towards evidence-based medicine? And these new techniques and new ideas are coming about. While Letterman is in school, uh, they are using ether and chloroform for the first time as anesthetic. It's gonna be a medical revolution that's gonna be around at the time of the Civil War. All of this is happening uh, in these crucial years leading up to the Civil War. And Letterman is right there during this. He is learning. He is absorbing all of this information that is, is coming out. This is an exciting time to be in medicine in the United States of America. But then Letterman's going to do something a little different uh, than many of his counterparts. So he's going to take a pretty uh, rarefied course of action uh, upon his graduation from Jefferson Medical College. He is going to join the United States Army. This was not normal in the time period before the American Civil War. Uh, there are not going to be too many doctors who are going to take this, uh, take this road. Um, and in fact, it was, it was pretty difficult to get in. And so this is gonna kind of be, again, rarefied uh, air that Letterman is stepping into. 
Uh, he is going to take the military medical exam in New York City in the summer of 1849 after his graduation. And he's going to be accepted along with this other gentleman uh, on June 29th, 1849. Now, the reason I have uh, the other gentleman, you'll notice Letterman is on the left, and we have William Hammond on the right. Now, both of these men are appointed assistant surgeons in the US Army on the same day in New York City. These two men's lives and careers are going to cross paths numerous times. Uh, most importantly, uh, during 1862 and 1863, uh, when these men worked together as part of the US Army's medical department. Uh, we'll get to that in just a bit, but I, I wanna bring and introduce them uh, now. Letterman on the left, William Hammond on the right. William Hammond is gonna go on to be Surgeon General of the US Army uh, during the middle part of the Civil War. And these two men are gonna have a relationship. They're going to be uh, a working relationship that is gonna prove valuable to both men. Uh, they're going to be politically connected together. Uh, ultimately, that's gonna to prove to be the undoing of William Hammond. Uh, and in a way, Jonathan Letterman himself as well. Uh, they're going to have profound impacts on American medicine together. So. Letterman, back to, back to him over here on the left. When they join, when Letterman joins the US Army, he is 24 years of age. He is quite ambitious and he is ready for action. Uh, and that is going to, uh, he's gonna find quite a bit of that in the years before the Civil War. And even if it's not action so much, uh, he is going to uh, be well-traveled um, as many uh, officers within the US Army were during the uh, years leading up to the Civil War. Uh, there are, con you know, when Letterman comes in in 1849, we had just fought the Mexican-American War. Uh, and so there are, uh, there's a lot of new territory that needs to be explored. There is a lot of uh, areas in the West, uh, the areas that have not been formally absorbed into the United States as territories, uh, essentially ungoverned spaces uh, upon which American citizens and Americans are traveling across the continent on their way to places like California, uh, which are, you know, you'll notice 1849 here. So crucial years as California is experiencing a gold rush and people are pouring in. The U.S. Army is responsible for guarding this frontier. Uh, they're going to be uh, participating in uh, actions, making sure that, that these travel routes to the West are going to be safe and secure. And Letterman's going to find himself uh, thrown into this mix. So as you can see here, he, he's gone to a lot of different places. Uh, he is uh, very well traveled between Florida, Minnesota, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, to Virginia briefly before the Civil War, California again, uh, and then ultimately when the Civil War breaks out, he comes back uh, east. He is treating during this time period at most 100 soldiers, maybe a few hundred soldiers at max. Uh, the army was significantly smaller in the years before the Civil War uh, and is widely scattered. So these are small commands that he has medical command over, that he is responsible for the medical care uh, for these commands in, in what are mostly small forts or small expeditions. Uh, in this time, as was normal for doctors uh, in the US Army on the frontier, uh, he actually treated uh, far more cases of, of arrow wounds than actually gunshot wounds and in, in kind of fighting and combat with uh, Native American tribes on the frontier. Uh, so arrow wounds were more typical in many cases than gunshot wounds. Uh, but most of what he was doing in these frontier bases was dealing with disease, uh, trying to stave off malnutrition, uh, trying to stave off scurvy, trying to scrounge whatever they could to ensure that these men in these army fortifications on the frontier were, uh, were healthy that they were of uh, comfort is, is not existent uh, at this time, uh, but to make sure that these men had what they needed and that they got the medical attention that they deserved. When the Civil War breaks out, as you can see here, uh, Letterman was in California. So literally as far away in the continental United States as he could be from where the action was beginning. He is recalled from the West back to the East and he is going to actually come in. He's gonna be originally uh, given a medical medical purveyorship in New York, and then ultimately was transferred to the Department of West Virginia at the beginning of 1862. And this is where the paths cross again, a decade after uh, William Hammond and Jonathan Letterman were both appointed to the US Army as assistant surgeons. This is where these two men's 
uh, paths, their careers are going to come together again. That's going to bring up our collaboration term, our theme of collaboration. These two men are going to begin working together in West in the Department of West Virginia in early 1862, and they're going to do some really cool things. So these are both young medical officers, both in their 30s when the Civil War breaks out, and they both have ambition and drive. They want to make a name for themselves. They want to have influence over this conflict. They want to change the U.S. Army's medical department in a progressive direction. They want to make it better. The U.S. Army medical department did not laurel itself with glory in the first year of the war. They did things pretty disastrously. Letterman, Hammond want to change that. They're going to work together towards that end. So Letterman's going to come into the Department of West Virginia. He is going to end up becoming a medical director there. Hammond is in West Virginia as medical purveyor. Um, and these two men are gonna both become interested in hospitals and hospital design. Uh, They're going to establish some of the first military hospitals out in uh, Western Virginia, which was a theater of conflict uh, in the first year of the war. And they're also gonna get together and they're going to design new ambulances. Uh, and these ambulances would ensure that patients could travel with some comfort. Uh, and ultimately the design that is going to come from this is known as the wheeling ambulance. It's gonna be used during the Civil War and is named for wheeling uh, what is now West Virginia, what was then Virginia, uh, which was where these men spent some of their time where they were actually based. So together, they're working on ambulances, they're working on hospital design and, and creating hospital system. And together, they're creating this working relationship. Hammond is going to get plucked um, as a result kind of, a, of his superiority in terms of, of organization and in terms of wanting to make American battlefield medicine better. He is going to get called up in April 1862 to become the U.S. Army Surgeon General. Uh, he is going to leapfrog dozens of medical officers in terms of seniority. And it's not going to necessarily make him popular, especially among the old guard within the United States Army's medical department. But Hammond is very laser focused on reform. And that is exactly what the Lincoln administration in the U.S. Army is looking for at this stage of the conflict. Medical disasters aside, they want to change things. They want to move things forward. So Hammond's call to action to reform the medical department of the U.S. Army, uh, where it utterly failed in the first year of the war. That is Hammond's uh, mandate. What is he is out to uh, ensure happens. Um, and this is what they're facing. The first year of the war, again, those of you who've been watching these videos uh, have come and visited the museum before. Um, you are familiar with this story. Uh, for those of you who may have be learning this story for the first time or haven't yet visited the museum, I, I hope you'll come to Frederick and, and check out the National Museum of Civil War Medicine as we talk quite a bit about this. In the first year of the American Civil War was an unmitigated medical nightmare. Uh, this is we're dealing with larger armies than had ever been fielded before in American history. Hundreds of thousands of men are going to be uh, thrown into the mix, into the armies of the United States and the Confederate States. And there are very, there's very little in the way of infrastructure to deal with them. Uh, they're uh, supplying these armies was very difficult at the outset. Uh, for the Confederates, they're going to face that throughout the conflict. But even for the U.S. Army, who by the end of the war is going to be uh, drowning in supplies, uh, at the beginning of the war, it was very difficult to uh, get food to these men, to get them the basics that they needed for soldiering. And medical supplies fall into that category as well. There was also very little organization. Uh, there was very, very little in the way of ambulances to get wounded soldiers off the battlefield. There are no constructed military hospitals. Everything is makeshift in the first year of the war. And medical knowledge is just not up to what we need in this conflict. Uh, there's very little experience among American surgeons with gunshot wounds because there hadn't been a major conflict in the United States uh, before, up to this point. We're dealing with modern weaponry that is gonna be used in this conflict as well. Disease, you're creating essentially, these armies are small cities, in some cases actually quite large cities. Out in the middle of the countryside, uh, here in, in Washington DC where I'm at, a entire city is ringed uh, with army camps and fortifications. And 
what this means is these men are living in very unsanitary conditions. Uh, they're going to be living in conditions that are far from ideal. Uh, water is contaminated. Disease is rife. And there's very little medical knowledge, very little medical infrastructure to deal with this. Uh, as the war goes on, things will improve. But the first year of the war is a nightmare. And the U.S. Army's medical department specifically is incredibly unprepared for this. They're much more focused before the Civil War on saving money, on making sure that they're coming in below uh, what the Army had given them in terms of money. They are an area that is constantly being cut and now they are crucially important. And the leaders of the US Army's medical department in the first year of the war are not up to the task of reforming their department and moving it in a direction to care for the large numbers of patients, the large numbers of wounded and sick soldiers that are coming from this conflict. So we need these new ideas, the new ideas that folks like Letterman, folks like William Hammond are generating uh, within the Army's medical department, just at the lower ranks uh, with less seniority. They have bold ideas and those bold ideas are going to be put into practice. So when Letterman is, is kind of coming up, he's in the Department of West Virginia in early 1862, uh, most of the focus obviously is not on Western Virginia. It's not on the Department of West Virginia. Letterman is out of the public eye. He is outside of, of you know, where the main action is happening. Not for long though. So in the, uh, in Virginia, between Washington and the Confederate capital at Richmond in the spring of 1862, we have a major offensive, south and east of Richmond specifically. Uh, that is gonna be the Peninsula Campaign as George McClellan, head of the Army of the Potomac is moving his army towards Richmond. This is proving to be throughout the spring of 1862, a medical disaster. Uh, lack of ambulances, lack of military hospitals, lack of transportation for wounded back to hospitals in Washington, D.C. in terms of the ships you need. Uh, it is pretty disastrous. And this is going to add up to mean that a significant chunk of McClellan's 100,000 man plus Army of the Potomac are down sick or are dealing with the lingering effects of wounds on the peninsula. Things are not going well. Hammond arrives as Surgeon General of the U.S. Army in April of 1862 and begins to force through his reforms. He is going to emphasize that new surgeons coming in have a background in scientific medicine. Uh, in part of that, he's going to open the Army Medical Museum here in Washington, D.C., what is now the National Museum of Health and Medicine. And he's going to encourage the modernizing of medical infrastructure such as hospitals, ambulances, battlefield evacuation systems, those sorts of things. And he's going to be looking to find like-minded military surgeons within the U.S. Army to help him exact this change, make the U.S. Army's medical care better, make it more efficient, make sure that our wounded soldiers and our sick soldiers are being cared for properly. Because not only is that a good public relations victory, uh, which, of course, the Lincoln administration is, they're looking in the fall, there's a midterm election coming up. They're going to have to face the American people. They want to ensure that they can say that the U.S. Army is progressing in terms of how it cares for its wounded and sick soldiers, because it's a morale issue on the home front, also for the soldiers themselves. And it's also a military problem, because having 30 or 40 percent of your army down sick while you're trying to actively campaign against the enemy is not sustainable. You need to make conditions, medical conditions within the army better so you can keep more soldiers with the army and ultimately turn those soldiers around and put them back on the front lines. This is how Hammond is thinking. This is ultimately how Letterman is thinking. And this is going to push American battlefield medicine forward in terms of how these uh, soldiers are going to be cared for and the infrastructure and the systems that are going to be in place to take care of them. So the campaign specifically in the Virginia Peninsula uh, in the theater of war between Richmond and Washington are going to emphasize the importance of change. You see this in the spring of 1862, even after, uh, even after Hammond is appointed before Letterman's gonna join into the action in Virginia, we see the need for change in the Army of the Potomac. This is a very famous photograph uh, that many of you I'm sure are familiar with from Savage's Station 
uh, in Virginia. This is a, a field hospital in operation, a very rare photograph in terms of the war showing the chaos of what one of these battlefield hospitals would have looked like. Uh, on the battlefields of the seven days, not enough ambulances, not enough medical personnel, little in the way of transportation for the wounded and the sick back to DC. In fact, so bad that the United States Sanitary Commission actually used to come in, basically save the US Army's butt because there were not enough ships uh, to carry wounded soldiers uh, up the Chesapeake Bay, up the Potomac River uh, to Washington, to other hospitals uh, in, in the immediate area of the nation's capital. On the battlefield, total chaos. This photograph demonstrates that. You're, you're looking at what that chaos was like in, in early 1862 and really for the early part of the Civil War when it came to battlefield medicine. No trained stretcher bearers. Evacuation of the wounded was done by comrades bringing able-bodied men off the front lines in droves. Hospitals became, refuge, ref, uh, became refuges uh, for wounded soldiers, but also for those of seeking to avoid combat. Uh, a handy way to get out of combat in the early part of the Civil War is to carry off your wounded comrades. It also helped, I mean, these men did have humanitarian aims in mind. In many cases, these units, these Civil War soldiers are fighting with men from their hometowns or, or even from their own families. They want to see to their comrades being cared for properly. Uh, but very rarely did those soldiers, once they carried their wounded comrade back to the hospital, very rarely did they go back to the front lines and back to their units to go back into combat. I think understandably so. And so this becomes a major problem. You're taking able-bodied men off the front lines, off the firing line. You're taking muskets away from the army where it needs those muskets the most. Hospitals at this stage, 1862, are organized within the U.S. Army at the regimental level. Uh, that means that uh, hospitals that are uh, regimental hospitals would have a few personnel, a surgeon, an assistant surgeon, a hospital steward, sometimes uh, two assistant surgeons, uh, a chaplain, and that's it. And you have the medical supplies available to one regiment, a thousand man, ideally, a thousand man regiment. Uh, you won't have medical supplies to care for the wounded that would come from that unit. But what happens when that regimental hospital is located closest to the battlefield? most easily accessible to wounded soldiers streaming back. Uh, they don't care. A wounded soldier doesn't care what regimental hospital they're showing up at. They're caring about seeing that red flag that signified a hospital and signified medical care. Uh, and they're going to find the one that is easiest, the path of least resistance to getting the medical attention they need. That overwhelms the regimental hospital systems and leaves other hospitals in the vicinity that might not be as close to the front lines. Uh, means that there's no one showing up at those hospitals, but the ones that do uh, receive patients end up being overwhelmed. We see that in this photograph. Overwhelming amount of patients, men lying out, men awaiting medical attention, not enough supplies, not enough personnel to care for them. This is a problem. It's a problem that needs to be fixed. So the seven days campaign specifically shows how badly U.S. Army medicine could be uh, without these systems that are, are needed. And so it's a time for a change. Uh, General George McClellan at the top of the Army of the Potomac also recognizes this. And so he and Hammond, the Surgeon General of the U.S. Army, are going to end up kind of thinking about this. Uh, and ultimately, they're going to be kind of maneuvering going on to get a new medical director brought into the Army of the Potomac. And that is going to be uh, William, uh, that is going to be Jonathan Letterman. So Letterman returns. Uh, he is coming into this story yet again, um, and he is going to be partnered up with the uh, head of the Army of the Potomac, the U.S. Army's most famous general at this point, uh, most influential as well, uh, that is going to be George McClellan. So we have Jonathan Letterman on the left, George McClellan, the young Napoleon on the right. Letterman becomes the medical director of the Army of the Potomac on July 1st, 1862, as the Army of the Potomac was evacuating uh, from the outskirts of Richmond during the Seven Days Campaign to the James River. His new army commander, as I mentioned, George McClellan here, McClellan was immediately impressed by meeting Letterman. Uh, this is what McClellan had to say upon their first interview. He says, quote, I saw immediately that Letterman was the man for the occasion. That once gave him my unbounded confidence. He had but one thing in view, the best possible organization of his department, and that not 
that he might gain credit or promotion by the results of his work, but that he might do all in his power to diminish the inevitable sufferings of the soldiers and the efficiency of the army. So you can see right from the start, McClellan has a very positive view of Letterman. They're going to have a very good relationship. I'm sure that this is in part influenced by the fact that Letterman studied at Jefferson Medical College, the institution that George B. McClellan's father founded earlier in the 19th century. Uh, I'm sure that this is gonna have some bearing. But these two men are going to get off very well. I think in part two, it's important to, to recognize that George McClellan, uh, for all of his shortcomings and in some cases failings, I know I know people will argue about this to the end of the world, in the end of the world. I am not weighing in on this on either side, but undeniably George McClellan cared about his troops. He cared about the soldiers that he led. And so did Letterman. Letterman wanted to do a better job of caring for these men when they needed it most, when they're wounded, when they're sick. And so that it's gonna mean that this relationship is going to go very, very well. They're going to work together and they're going to make some incredible change and make it very rapidly in the summer of 1862. Long summer of collaboration between McClellan and Letterman is built upon trust and confidence. Uh, and they're going to jump into action right away. Letterman is going to go to work very quickly. Within a week of arriving, uh, he is going to be making some big sweeping changes. So again, collaboration, very important. Uh, need to be thinking about um, that as we are, as we are uh, going through the rest of the presentation. So let's go to some innovations here. What is Letterman up to in the Army of the Potomac? Uh, one of the first things he tackles uh, actually is about sanitation and food. He was wanted to ensure that the army was healthy in these pretty awful summer camps along the James River. Uh, those of you that may have visited, you know, go to the Gaines Mill Battlefield, go to Malvern Hill, go to the bottomlands of the James River southeast of Richmond, and you'll see that it is a pretty swampy, pretty unhealthy, hot, humid mosquito infested environment. It is not a great place to spend the summer in Virginia. Uh, and these armies are, are never really healthy and these army camps are never healthy. Letterman wants to change that. So he focuses the, on that initially, make the health of the army better, ensure sanitary conditions, uh, policing where latrines are gonna be located, making sure that men are not drinking from uh, super incredibly tainted water sources, making sure that they have the food they need. Scurvy was a big problem uh, in this army, making sure that they get the rations that they need to keep them healthy, to build up their strength after a spring of fighting and get them back into the field and get them back ready to go. Then he moves on from food and sanitation to what became his military's, uh, military life's work the ambulances. Uh, Letterman sought to, quote, devise a system, unquote, that brought ambulances to where they were needed most, the battlefield. After consultation with Letterman, McClellan is going to issue General Orders, one, uh, General Orders 147 that is going to lay out Letterman's plan. This orders issued in the summer of 1862 takes the ambulances, which you're seeing a photograph of ambulances used during the Civil War, uh, takes the ambulances away from the quartermaster department, which is where they were for the first year of the war. Quartermaster department is not necessarily keen on using its very important wagons to carry off wounded soldiers. I'm much more interested about getting bullets to the front line, getting food, supplying the army with what it needs. Not so much interested in evacuating the wounded, nor does uh, do the officers in its command have medical expertise. So we're gonna take the ambulances from the quartermaster department, give them to the medical department, give them to those who have the medical expertise, uh, who want to uh, exact some change in regards to how the army evacuates its wounded. Um, it's also going to, let's go back here just for a second, also going to lay down a new standard for battlefield evacuation. Um, these ambulances are gonna play a starring role in what Letterman is gonna do next. He is going to, uh, create a trained group of stretcher bearers and ambulance crews for work on the battlefield. Up to this point, ambulance drivers in the quartermaster department many times 
Uh, they're contractors. Uh, in some cases, they are with the army. Uh, but they are not trained in any regard in terms of going to the battlefield, extracting wounded soldiers. There's no training in that regard. So if those men are doing it. They're bravely, courageously doing it kind of of their own volition, not necessarily of the, what they were ordered to do, what their training had instilled in them. That changes with lettering. These stretcher bearers and ambulance crews are going to be responsible, it's their responsibility, their military work uh, to pick up the wounded, deposit them in field hospitals at the Rio. Uh, there is a line here uh, from a biographer um, that talks about this Orders 147. Um, and I, I just love it so much. Uh, quote it here, it says, quote, in the space of a single order, Letterman redefined battlefield evacuation from a post-battle scavenger hunt to one marked by military discipline. That is just sums up so much and so short. I, I only wish I could be so succinct uh, and precise. Um, this system that Letterman uh, began to put in place would begin to perfect during the Civil War, during his time with the Army of the Potomac, begins to take shape in the summer of 1862. For the first time, the U.S. Army has a medical plan put in place uh, and one to take care of its wounded soldiers during combat. So like the military, like the frontline commanders, like George McClellan is going to have his battle plans, Jonathan Letterman and the medical department of the U.S. Army are going to begin having their own plans, their medical plans to deal with the casualties coming off the battlefield uh, from, from the front lines of war. And even the hospitals where the patients were going to be treated on the battlefield were, were in for uh, their own needed reform. So we're going to see a change in terms of where these hospitals are and how they are uh, staffed, maintained in a battlefield setting. We're going to move from regimental hospitals and we're going to go to division hospitals. Uh, field hospitals were reconfigured under Letterman's orders. So instead of regimental hospitals, we're seeing an example here uh, from an army camp. Um, this comes from, um, I believe, hardtack and coffee. This sketch comes from, uh, from that. Um, it's gonna move away from this single regimental hospital to a centralized staffing and resources of a division hospital. Uh, we're going to provide better and more uniform care across the army during the course of a battle under Letterman's plan. He trained, Letterman trained his crews and medical staff under these new orders that he issued, under 147 uh, throughout the month of August, 1862. Uh, but as he's going through this training regimen, of course, things are happening in other theaters of the war. In fact, things are happening very close to the area of operations of the Army of the Potomac, just north uh, in central Virginia and central and northern Virginia, things are heating up in August of 1862. Um, so after the battle of, uh, I'm sure here, at the battle of Second Bull Run, which is taking place, Letterman's trying to staff up, get his men trained in this new system that has been created. Uh, meanwhile, activity going on in, in other parts of Virginia, including uh, Cedar Mountain, ultimately the battle of Second Bull Run. Uh, the army of Virginia under John Pope is gonna get utterly crushed by Robert E. Lee, the second battle of Bull Run. Uh, this leaves thousands of wounded scattered all over that battlefield. Uh, the, but the Army of Virginia had not yet adopted a system like Letterman had put in place in the Army of the Potomac. And that means there's no organized evacuation system or plan. The result is thousands of wounded soldiers were left on the battlefield for days, sometimes upwards of a week, in brutal weather conditions with no medical attention. Uh, for those of you that, again, maybe follow in the museum or, or kind of up on things when it comes to Civil War history, you may remember uh, at Manassas a few years back, they did discover a pit with uh, human remains, including uh, two sets of remains that turned out to be U.S. Army soldiers killed at Second Bull Run and a number of amputated limbs. Uh, though that discovery actually documents the chaos in the wake of the Second Battle of Bull Run from the medical perspective. Uh, those bones that were found of the amputated limbs, uh, they were actually, in, in, those surgeries were performed days after the battle was over, uh, as they were collecting uh, the wounded from all over the battlefield, because there was no plan. There was no Letterman plan in place in the Army of Virginia. And so there's going to be a big difference from what happens in Second Bull Run 
in August of 1862 to what is gonna happen just a few weeks later in Maryland with the Army of the Potomac and Jonathan Letterman in medical command. So as the armies uh, move forward, move uh, north, Lee, of course, goes into, uh, goes into Maryland, crosses the Potomac River in early September. The Army of the Potomac under George McClellan with Jonathan Letterman in tow and the Army's ambulances uh, in tow. They're heading for uh, Maryland and they're heading for a, uh, heading towards Letterman's first real challenge uh, with the Army of the Potomac. Uh, with that, I'm gonna take a quick break here um, and just drop in over here to see, uh, see our comments. So I hope you all are enjoying the uh, program so far. Uh, see, so we have 66 people here right now, which is awesome. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, so we have comments coming in, lots of comments. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, I do want to say, if you are enjoying the program, please consider liking if you haven't already liked the video or sharing. Uh, that helps more people to see the video. Uh, consider becoming a member as well. Uh, that will help to support uh, what we do at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine and here at the uh, Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum. Uh, I do see some questions here um, that we are going to get to. Well, one of them uh, from Andrea, thanks for watching Andrea, was Letterman Mary. We will get to that um, a little bit later in the program is going to play a play a role in what happens. Um, Robert asks, are these four words that we're talking about, um, are they uh, his own words? They are not his own words. Um, the, the collaboration, innovation, uh, those, those are themes identified by myself and the team at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine as kind of leadership opportunities, the things that, ident that we can identify that make Letterman into a, a good leader. Uh, that allowed him to do what he, he did best, to, to innovate, to make change. He had to uh, utilize these four themes, these four words. Um, he had to put them into practice. And we find that that leadership ability stretches from, we can take lessons from what Letterman did best and apply it to our own world today. Um, use those terms a lot when we talk to uh, military uh, medical professionals who come and visit the museum. I have the opportunity to take them to places like Antietam National Battlefield, which is a, a delight for me personally, uh, but also the opportunity to share Letterman's lessons uh, to, to folks who can actually, uh, who are doing the same work as Letterman today, which I, I find to be endlessly, uh, endlessly amazing. Um, Weren't reg regimental hospitals still used as triage or other? We're gonna get into that in just a bit. Uh, talk about the systems in Letterman's plan. Uh, regimental hospitals are still gonna be found in, in camp settings, um, but on the battlefields in the Army of the Potomac, uh, division hospitals are going to be uh, the rule of the day following uh, 1862. Uh, did Letterman draw from the War of 1812 manuals or on camp sanitation and health of soldiers? This is a great question, Mike. Um, just ask, thank you for, for adding this in. Uh, Letterman didn't necessarily take uh, anything as far as I know directly from the War of 1812, um, but what he did take was uh, kind of a general sense of things that were happening in the French army during the Napoleonic era in terms of ambulances and battlefield evacuation. Uh, Letterman is often called the father of modern battlefield medicine. Uh, he is kind of a second generation of, of battlefield medical innovators. The first are gonna be uh, in the uh, Napoleonic army of, of France, um, specifically a Dr. Loray um, in, in France is going to be responsible for adapting and creating a, an ambulance system, very effective flying ambulances in the French army during the Napoleonic age. Letterman took inspiration from that and he's going to apply those lessons from Loray to the uh, United States Army in the Civil War, adapting Loray's system to include things like railroads and steamships and these new modern hospitals, the ability to transport people and goods significantly faster. Uh, so Letterman, what he's doing is not creating anything necessarily new, uh, but he is adapting what already exists and brings it into a new modern setting. Uh, and that is going to ensure that men are going to, lives are going to be saved um, who in other cases before Letterman systems are adapted and created wouldn't necessarily have had the opportunity, um, had the opportunity to survive their wounds. They're gonna be evacuated faster than ever before. All right, so we're gonna go back here to our screen share. Um, let me go here and we'll go back to our program. 
Thank you all so much for dropping your comments in. I appreciate that. We'll come back around at the end of the program here uh, and, uh, and, and answer any question, other questions that you all might have had. Um, so back to where we are in terms of the, oh, goodness. there we go, uh, to where we are in the war. So in the uh, spring or in the uh, late summer of 1862, sorry about that, uh, we are dealing with the Maryland campaign. And this is gonna be Letterman's big test. We are commemorating the anniversary of that, of, of this campaign right now. In fact, today is the anniversary of the Battle of South Mountain, where we're gonna talk about in just a second. Letterman is going to go on campaign with the Army of the Potomac for the first time as its medical director as it goes into Maryland. And he is going to immediately be thinking about the medical realities on the ground in Maryland. He anticipates, as does George McClellan, the Army commander, as did the Lincoln administration, that there is going to be some titanic clash between Robert, Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia and the Army of the Potomac somewhere in Maryland or Pennsylvania in September 1862. And so Letterman immediately begins thinking about where can he pre-stage supplies? Where can he pre-stage personnel? Where can he create a staging ground to ensure that those wounded during this campaign are going to receive quick, effective medical care? And he is going to arrive in Frederick, Maryland with the Army of the Potomac on September 12, 1862. And he immediately recognizes that Frederick had everything he needed in terms of a space to pre-stage supplies. He understood again that a major battle is likely somewhere in the vicinity of, of central Western Maryland or Southern Pennsylvania. And Frederick was close to those areas, adequate roads connecting potential battlefields. But Frederick was a perfect evacuation center because it was connected to the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad railroad that he could then quickly evacuate patients um, back to Baltimore, to Washington uh, as well, even as far as Philadelphia, could be within fairly easy access to, to evacuate wounded soldiers back to uh, new hospitals that are being established by William Hammond. Um, and so he's thinking, Letterman's thinking about this before the battle even starts. And that's what's remarkable about this. No one had done this at this scale before in the US Army, what Letterman is doing at Frederick in the days before the Battle of South Mountain and the Battle of Antietam. Uh, you will also notice uh, a number of churches uh, in this sketch. I, I love this sketch of, of Frederick in late 1862. And those churches provide, as well as other public buildings in Frederick, a perfect place to temporarily house wounded and sick soldiers before they are ultimately shipped off to a larger uh, purpose-built military hospitals. So 34 large buildings are going to be chosen in Frederick. Uh, they're going to be transformed into waiting operating rooms. This is going to be the first time that these two men are going to be working together. Uh, McClellan on the right, Letterman on the left. Communication is going to be really important uh, between these two men, the uh, commander of the army, the medical director of the army. These two men are going to have to work together very well. This is going to be their first experience. They're going to experience battle together on a large scale for the first time at South Mountain on September 14th. It is a Union victory. Letterman monitors his new evacuation system and watched it work well on a battlefield that was scattered over miles of uh, Maryland mountainous countryside. Uh, he, over the course of the battle, he consults with McClellan um, and at the battle's conclusion, he is ensuring that his medical teams had priority on the roads back to hospitals uh, and that were also established in other towns near the battlefield, like Burkittsville, like Middletown. Um, like Jefferson. These are going to be towns that are going to take on wounded soldiers after the battle. Ultimately, Battle of South Mountain has 5,000 casualties, and more than 3,000 of whom were wounded, and many of them fell into Letterman's system. They fell to Letterman's uh, control because the Union Army, U.S. Army, controls the battlefield at the end of the day. Letterman consults with McClellan again as the Army creeped forward towards Antietam Creek. As the Antietam battle plan took shape, Letterman put, prepared an estimated 100 hospital facilities in the vicinity of what would become the Antietam battlefield. At the Battle of Antietam, Letterman is gonna have 300 ambulances available uh, under his command and a medical staff of 550. 
the relationship between the commander and medical director would play a crucial role in the battle that came. On September 17th, 1862, the first major test of Letterman's evacuation system got underway. So this is gonna be the Battle of Antietam. Over the course of 12 bloody hours of brutal combat, 23,000 casualties, 10,000 of the wounded from this battle are going to fall into the hands of Letterman's trained stretcher bearers and ambulance drivers. Uh, this battle is unlike anything that had been experienced uh, in the Army of the Potomac to this point. Um, battles of this size had been fought. Um, Shiloh, thinking Second Bull Run has equal number of casualties, but it span, spans over several days. This is 12 hours, and the U.S. Army has to deal with 10,000 wounded soldiers. This is unprecedented. This is larger than anything uh, seen in a single day during the Civil War uh, or in the rest of American history. So this is what Letterman is facing. These are the challenges that he is, this is his first major test with the system. But where is Letterman going to be? Well, there's a reason that we have the Pry House Field Hospital Museum in our system. And that is because at the Pry House, Letterman is going to spend most of the day of the Battle of Antietam, uh, along with many of the staff of McClellan and McClellan himself for much of the battle. Uh, and Letterman's gonna help establish a division hospital on the site in the barn, just down the hill, just to the right um, of, of this, uh, this house is a barn that is gonna care for between four and 700 wounded soldiers during the battle. At the Pry House, Letterman himself personally oversaw the medical care given to uh, two wounded Union generals, Joseph Hooker shot in the foot, and uh, Israel Richardson, a division commander in the Second Corps who uh, took a shell fragment through his chest. Um, and so this is in addition to him managing the medical response to this battle. As this is going to be Letterman's plan in action. So we're going to go through each of these steps um, and looking at it in this Antietam context. Of, of how Letterman's battlefield evacuation plan actually worked. So the first step in the plan is uh, the, what is known as the dressing station. We would call them first aid stations today. This is where field dressings are gonna be applied, bandages, tourniquets. Uh, this is gonna be the first line of medical attention that a wounded soldier is going to get to. Wounded soldiers are gonna get to field dressing stations, which are usually located a few hundred yards behind the front lines uh, in an area either shielded by a building, shielded by the ground itself at Antietam often provided space for field dressing stations, shelter from the storm and rain of bullets and shells. Wounded soldiers are gonna self-evacuate to these field dressing stations in many cases. In other cases, they're gonna be brought on by comrades or, or stretcher bearers, trained stretcher bearers are gonna go out and actually pick them up off the battlefield and bring them to these stations. Um, this is, again, where tourniquets are going to be applied, stop the flow of blood, preparing patients for transport back to the field hospitals, the division-sized field hospitals, um, making sure, in some cases, the patients are comfortable. They're going to be administering drugs at the front line. This includes things like opium to, to deal and address pain. Uh, this is alcohol is going to be given in copious amounts. Um, at these field dressing stations, oftentimes in brandy or whiskey form. This was believed to be a stimulant. Ideas, they don't know fully what shock is yet, but they understand that uh, what it does to the body. And so they're trying to give the body a boost. That first shot of whiskey or brandy makes the cheeks go flush, uh, brings the pulse up a bit. They're administering that at these field dressing stations. Then they're gonna load them up in the sketch made at Antietam um, by Alfred Wad. Um, they're going to put the wounded soldiers onto ambulances and evacuate them back to the rear. In some cases, stretcher bearers will help to carry the wounded that far. Um, this is an example of a field hospital at, at Antietam, actually one that is uh, it's not the Pry House, though it is uh, very similar in terms of, uh, of the ground and the barn. And this is something, a scene that would have been very familiar to Letterman and those doctors working at Antietam, the scene very much looked like this. Um, this is where surgery is happening. And division hospitals mean that uh, you are centralizing staff, you are centralizing uh, the equipment you need, and you're also centralizing where all of the wounded are being sent to. So these were placed very deliberately, close to roads, close to the front lines, but far enough away from the front lines as to not receive fire uh, from the, uh, the, the enemy guns on the other side of Antietam Creek. Uh, so these hospitals, this is where surgery, this is where amputation is taking place. These are crucially important in Letterman's system. So 
From here, then wounded soldiers would be collected. Once they're stable enough to be moved, they're moved on to Frederick, Maryland. Um, they're going to be taken to Frederick, in some cases taken to, to nearby Hagerstown, uh, and then put onto trains and taken to these uh, hospital facilities uh, that are established for the purposes of recuperation. Uh, those military hospitals are gonna be in Washington, they're gonna be in Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, other smaller communities like Frederick will actually have permanent hospital facilities as well. And that is where those soldiers ideally will recover and then if possible be sent back out to the front lines. Letterman's system is very much devised to keep wounded and sick soldiers within the military system, uh, to keep them under military control so they don't get sent home to their families because the soldiers that did that didn't really come back. Again, kind of understandably so. Uh, this keeps military order. And it means that you're going to get more able-bodied men back to the front lines when those wounded and sick soldiers do eventually recover. So what Letterman and his team did at Antietam was remarkable. 10,000 wounded soldiers brought off the battlefield within 24 hours, fastest ever response. Letterman lauded his medical department for their work. He said, quote, the skillful attention shown by the medical officers of this army to the wounded upon the battlefields of South Mountain, Crampton's Gap, and the Antietam under trying circumstances gives the assurance that with this organization, the medical staff of the Army of the Potomac can with confidence be relied upon under all emergencies to take charge of the wounded entrusted to its care. But as this photograph shows, this is a photograph taken in October of 1862, about a month after the Battle of Antietam, uh, Letterman was pretty exhausted by this experience at Antietam, understandably so. He very carefully, very importantly, uh, you know, ensuring that these soldiers are getting the best medical care possible uh, and had to overcome a lot of challenges in order to do that. This did not go flawlessly. Uh, we'll get to in just a second. But Letterman is, of course, at the center of this image. Um, you might uh, recognize Civil War buffs out there. Uh, to the left, uh, on the left-hand side is John Buford, Cavalry Commander, famous for Gettysburg. He's in this photograph with Jonathan Letterman there, looking the most disheveled uh, and weary of all of the men in this photograph. Now, another innovation that's going to come from Antietam it's gonna be one that's gonna get used later famously at Gettysburg um, is what becomes known as Smoketown Hospital. This is a photograph taken of Smoketown Hospital. Um, and this is uh, a long-term healthcare facility established on the battlefield at Antietam. Uh, what Letterman and his team found and part of the system that they had created was that wounded soldiers would be quickly evacuated away from the makeshift battlefield field hospitals in people's houses and churches and barns and be taken on to transit hospitals, taken on to Frederick, Hagerstown, and then ultimately on to the, the, the regular military hospitals. But what they found is that many of the wounded were not stable enough to move. You could not move these men, they would probably die in transit. This is not a necessarily an easy journey to Hagerstown or to, or to Frederick. Uh, miles on rutted roads, in many cases, ambulances bouncing up and down, pretty rough ride. So in order to get these terribly wounded soldiers out of people's private property, out of the citizens of Sharpsburg and Keatesville, to get these soldiers out, they needed to create their own facility. But they're in the middle of the Maryland countryside. Uh, and so they're going to put up a tent hospital facility at Smoketown. Um, and this is going to be uh, where they're going to bring all of those terribly wounded soldiers, not stable enough to be moved. Um, they're going to care for them in one centralized location. That is going to be open until early 1863. So through the entire winter of 1862, their Smoketown makeshift hospital is going to take care of these wounded soldiers until the patients either are stable enough to be moved or they unfortunately pass away as a result of their injuries. This is a preview of what's going to be known as Camp Letterman at Gettysburg. This is the idea put into practice for the first time. Um, it's going to be on a much grander scale uh, used after the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863. So adaptation. So things didn't necessarily go totally well at Antietam. Uh, on the northern part of the battlefield, think the cornfield area of the fighting. Uh, heaviest action takes place. Battlefield conditions made it darn near impossible to get wounded soldiers off the battlefield until nightfall, just because of the nature of the ground, how many wounded soldiers there were, and how contested that ground was. Still a lot of weaponry flying. Even though major combat operations are done, by the morning, 
early afternoon of September 17th on the northern part of the battlefield, they essentially created a no man's land between the east and the west woods on the Antietam battlefield. So stretcher bearers, ambulances can't get out there until it gets dark because they'll get shot at otherwise. Um, on the southern part of the battlefield, uh, no ambulance system existed at all. Now, this is the area of uh, Burnside, Burnside's Bridge, the Ninth Corps of the, of the Army. Uh, they were not attached to the Army of the Potomac until the Maryland campaign, until September of 1862. So they missed out on Letterman's training sessions uh, in August of 1862. So no ambulance system, no organized ambulance system existed in that army. So they had to train those men as they were battle as they were evacuating wounded from the battlefield not exactly an ideal situation but they were able to get most the vast majority of the wounded off within 24 hours supplies also became an issue um, think of this after a long summer of fighting many of the units that are participating at Antietam are out of medical supplies uh, volunteers like Clara Barton uh, and organizations like the Sanitary Commission and the Christian Commission helped to fill the gaps. But Letterman nonetheless was troubled by this issue. He wanted to ensure that his army was well supplied and he wanted to make sure that there were people responsible uh, for ensuring that medical supplies were on the battlefield. So in the aftermath of Antietam, Letterman fine tunes his system. He issues a few circulars to the army with McClellan's approval. Uh, these sought to regulate soldiers rations more importantly though, they were to ensure that medical personnel were held responsible for keeping medical supplies on hand. He additionally began to regulate roles within the medical department, monitoring what surgeons, uh, assistant surgeons and stewards were doing within this system and ensuring that their roles fit their skill sets. As Letterman had seen, not all surgeons within the US Army were cut out for surgery. Uh, some specialization began within the Army of the Potomac's medical staff. Letterman wanted the best people doing this, their best work, and he mandated it uh, through rules and regulations within the Army's medical department. So, as you will know, uh, Civil War uh, aficionados out there watching this, uh, McClellan is not long to the command of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, in early November, uh, McClellan goes away. Um, he goes off to, uh, to stew in his own juices about what had happened at Antietam and how he had been wronged and then goes on to uh, run for uh, president against Abraham Lincoln, a man he hated uh, in November of 1864. So we need a new commander in the Army of the Potomac and that is going to be this gentleman here with the great facial hair, uh, Ambrose Burnside. Uh, Burnside largely left Letterman to continue the work um, with the Army of the Potomac as the Army moves on towards Fredericksburg, Virginia. But these two men don't have a history together. They don't necessarily, they don't know each other and they're not familiar with each other's work. And so that level of tr trust and understanding that existed between McClellan and Letterman is gone. Now we're gonna be dealing with a host of new commanders and it's gonna cause more stress and friction for, for Letterman. Of course, the next major action that Letterman and his medical team are gonna have to deal with the ramifications of, it's gonna be the Battle of Fredericksburg in December of 1862. Army of the Potomac at Fredericksburg, Virginia, under the orders of Burnside. Uh, logistical delays in this crucial bridge building over the Rappahannock River uh, means that uh, the army was really stuck, didn't get to keep up with its battle plan of November and ultimately is geared up to fight a battle, major battle at Fredericksburg in December of 1862. Uh, Letterman is actually gonna be able to use the advantages of the army being stuck on the wrong side of the Rappahannock River to get medical supplies in earnest to his army, uh, also to get ambulances. Uh, so by the time the battle breaks out on December 11th, 1862, Letterman has compiled more than a thousand ambulances. So go back to September uh, and go back to Antietam. For that campaign, he has 300 ambulances available. Months later, Fredericksburg, the advantages that he has been given of time to gather the medical supplies means he has a thousand ambulances available. But that time lost uh, is devastating to the Army of the Potomac uh, and Fredericksburg is going to be a disaster. As you can see, fighting is gonna end up breaking out in the town itself. And then ultimately on the heights outside the town, um, things are not going to go well for the Army of the Potomac, which means Letterman and the surgeons and assistant surgeons and stewards and ambulance drivers, stretcher bearers of the Army of the Potomac, 
they're going to have a rough couple of days dealing and keeping up with the casualties streaming in from this battle. So in the most lopsided battle of the war, the Army of the Potomac is crushed by Robert E. Lee's Confederates on the high ground outside Fredericksburg. Uh, for Letterman and his team, this means 10,000 more patients that need treatment. And the conditions on this battlefield meant that nearly all the hospitals in Fredericksburg were under direct fire from Confederate guns. All the wounded needed to be evacuated across the Rappahannock River on pontoon bridges that were also semi-exposed to enemy fire. So this is a battlefield that is presenting all kinds of challenges to the Army of the Potomac's medical department and to Letterman. When Burnside finally abandoned plans to continue the Army's advance on Confederate positions, Letterman faced a major problem. How do you quickly evacuate all 10,000 of your wounded uh, with even those with serious life-threatening wounds in a very rapid emergency situation. In this case, in the span of essentially a single night. Um, that's going to be the challenge facing Letterman. So on the evening of December 14th into December 15th, 1862, Letterman had been ordered to remove all of the wounded from Fredericksburg as part of the Army of the Potomac's retreat uh, across the Rappahannock River. Uh, this had to be done quickly and quietly for fear of inspiring a Confederate assault on the retreating Union columns. But under the circumstances, all wounded were got away under Letterman's plan. Under adverse conditions, Letterman's team adapted to the challenge they faced uh, on this battlefield. And Letterman ultimately received praise from one of the, uh, one of the core medical directors in the Sixth Corps uh, for this work, for what they were able to accomplish at Fredericksburg. This is what that uh, the sixth core medical director wrote, quote, the medical department has become so thoroughly systematized that wounded and sick men were cared for better than they had ever been in any army before. It was perfected by the efficient and earnest medical director of the army, Dr. Letterman, to whom belongs the honor of bringing about this desirable change. So Letterman's getting some credit for what he's doing. That credit is becoming more readily apparent by this time. Letterman is kind of, I don't want to say he's a controversial figure. Um, there are people that are willing to, to throw stones at his reputation, at him as a, as a man as well. Uh, many of those that um, worked with Letterman uh, closely understood how much he cared for the men and cared for the system and wanted to fine tune it. Uh, but others, especially those that didn't know him necessarily well, looked at him as cold and calculating and more so interested in this system and the plans than the actual medical care of the soldiers themselves. But what I think those folks missed out on is the idea that the plan and the system was crucial to ensuring that the men got the best care. And it's one thing to just care about them and be compassionate. It's another thing to make sure that the system exists to give them that care and compassion. Um, so that is going to be, uh, Letterman is going to get some criticism coming, especially in the time coming up. So Letterman and Burnside, their short term relationship here, they've only been working together for about a month uh, when the Battle of Fredericksburg takes place. In the aftermath of Fredericksburg, things begin to break down. Uh, Letterman sought to keep the army's wounded near Fredericksburg, uh, kind of similar to what he did after Antietam, um, to ensure a speedy return to service. Letterman had ensured that ample supplies were ready for them at Fredericksburg. Remember, he has all of this time, uh, weeks to gather supplies at, at, on the northern side uh, and eastern side of the Rappahannock River um, to care for all of these wounded soldiers. And he tries to convince his commander about this, but Burnside wants none of this. Uh, Burnside overrules Letterman and sends the wounded by rail back to Washington in what became a supremely chaotic evacuation that led to both criticism of Letterman for letting it happen and also of Burnside himself. Uh, Burnside and Letterman never hit it off the way that Letterman and McClellan did. Uh, and their relationship had no time to build before they went to battle together. And as the army was on the move uh, for the entirety of their time, their relationship uh, before this. There's no time sitting in camp. There's no time sitting around while these two men are working together, starting their work relationship. Uh, being overruled by the army commander in matters of the wounded and sick made Letterman chafe, to, to understate it. Uh, he never got over the slight and having his name attached to this major failure uh, in terms of caring for the wounded after Fredericksburg. 
And in the wake of the Fredericksburg fiasco and the following mud march uh, of 1863, we are going to lose Ambrose Burnside. He's going to be sent out west. Um, and eventually we'll come back to the Army of the Potomac. Um, but he is out. Uh, and Letterman's going to need to deal with a new boss. That is going to be this gentleman. Who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. That is Joseph Hooker. Uh, he is going to be brought into the Army of the Potomac at arguably its lowest morale, its, its lowest ebb in terms of military organization and efficiency. Uh, and he is brought in himself to be a reformer in a way that Letterman was as well. Um, they want to fix the Army of the Potomac and its many problems after a year of brutal battles and in many cases, many defeats uh, to bring this army back to strength, get it ready for action again in early 1863. Uh, this is going to be perfect timing. These two men are going to actually work pretty well together uh, in the early parts of 1863 to get the Army of the Potomac uh, into fighting order. One of the first things they're going to do together when they begin collaborating is going to be fixing the Army camps. Um, beginning of 1863, things were looking pretty desperate in the Army of the Potomac. Disease on the rise, food terrible, poorly supplied, morale at arguably its lowest point. Desertion from the Army of the Potomac at this time. And there are people, there are guys leaving by the hundreds each night, heading north, getting away from the Army of the Potomac. They are not excited about this war effort. They're not excited about fighting anymore. Uh, and a lot of that could be traced to the conditions that they were expected to live in and the food they were expected to eat. Uh, and these were not happy men. So they're going to try to fix this, Letterman and Hooker together. Um, one surgeon in the Army of the Potomac actually blamed Letterman himself for this, uh, for this, these conditions that existed in 1860, early 1863. Uh, he wrote, quote, I do not believe I have ever seen greater misery from sickness than exists now in our Army of the Potomac. I am forced to the conclusion that the principal medical officer is not equal to his responsible station and has failed in his duty either from having too much to do or from neglect. In this category, uh, it really was too much to do. Uh, in the wake of Burnside's kind of blundering at Fredericksburg and in the mud march, uh, there was just kind of pure chaos in the wake of this battle. And Letterman's trying to pick up the pieces. Um, and so with Burnside out and this new commander, Joe Hooker in, Letterman turns to Hooker to work together to fix these problems. The first one, food. In early 1863, Letterman tackled a commissary system that had utterly fallen apart. Poor rations were leading to unhealthy sick soldiers that helped drive morale to the breaking point. Letterman urged the issuing of fresh vegetables to soldiers whose health had collapsed under the weight of winter conditions and poor diet. Uh, he also turned to sanitary issues within the army. Winter encampments were notoriously awful places uh, and Letterman sought to clean them up and ensure soldiers had decent living conditions. In this, medical officers began to prod their commanders, their line commanders, to clean up their act, quite literally. It mostly worked, but there was some resistance that did take place uh, where medical officers were trying to mandate that uh, policing of camps will take place regularly to maintain the health of the soldiers. Um, some of this resistance led Letterman to spout off about some of these ignorant commanders. And I really like this passage. He says, quote, it is a popular delusion that the highest duties of medical officers are performed in prescribing a drug or amputating a limb. It is a matter of surprise that such prejudice should exist in this enlightened age. And were it well, if commanding officers would disabuse their minds of it and permit our armies to profit more fully by the beneficial advice of those who for years have made the laws of life a study. He wants those line commanders to listen to the medical officers, clean up those camps, get these soldiers healthy and get them ready to fight in the spring of 1863. Letterman's breathless efforts to help the army recover its strength played an important role in shaping the fighting unit the Army of the Potomac, that would engage in Hooker's first and only major campaign as the head of the Army of the Potomac. That's going to be Chancellorsville. So just as Hooker, um, Hooker is going to split up the Army of the Potomac in April of 1863 and early May um, to, to go and, and invest uh, the community of, the small community of uh, Chancellorsville 
kind of the west of Fredericksburg. Hooker plans to split up the army. That means that Letterman's system is going to get split up too. So with two distinct operating pieces, at least in Hooker's plan, that means that Letterman needs to split up his system. This is going to be, create some problems for Letterman and his team. As the main part of the army headed upriver from Fredericksburg in late April and early May, Letterman's ambulances and medical staff followed and set up hospitals in the vicinity of the crossroads at Chancellorsville. And this is where Letterman's system is going to shine. He put in his faith in his medical officers and the plan he had institutionalized, and things went fairly well, at least initially. Uh, but as the battle was beginning in the Chancellorsville area, Letterman ran into a problem with the commander. Uh, Joseph Hooker prevented a large number of the ambulances from traveling to the front. Most hospitals were to be established on the north side of the Rappahannock River, and stretcher bearer teams were largely detailed to the rear at the river crossings. Uh, this slows things down. Uh, the lack of ambulances and you're having to stretcher everybody to the north, uh, to the north side of the river across the pontoon bridges, this slows everything down. Uh, less efficient. Uh, means that these wounded soldiers are getting medical care that is not as good as it could be. Uh, it is slower. Uh, time is everything when it comes to battlefield medicine. Uh, they don't have golden hour. Uh, they have more of the golden 48 hours at this point. Uh, the quicker you apply medical attention to these wounded soldiers, the better their outcomes are going to be. Letterman's not really going to forgive Hooker for this action. It ultimately slows down this medical response to one of the bloodiest battles of the war at Chancellorsville. The campaign's circumstances also force Letterman to adapt as well. Lee's army cuts uh, Letterman's planned evacuation route to Fredericksburg. They're going to have two distinct parts of this campaign. You're going to have fighting in the vicinity of Fredericksburg with one part of Hooker's army, and you're going to have the main body of the army fighting at Chancellorsville and they are not able to communicate between each other. And so this means that wounded soldiers, the, the evacuation plan that was put in place before the battle has to change and adapt to what's going on to battlefield conditions. So all wounded uh, soldiers are being routed immediately directly north of the river over terrible roads, hospitals scattered pretty widely. Uh, and ultimately, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, things go very badly for Hooker and the Army of the Potomac during this fighting. Uh, and the Chancellorsville lines collapse, begin collapsing on May 2nd, and then the fighting on May 3rd is going to be particular, particularly brutal. Uh, and Letterman has a bit part to play in one of the more famous aspects of this battle. Um, and that is going to be the infamous moment when Joseph Hooker loses his nerve on May 3rd at Chancellorsville. Um, so Joe Hooker, uh, during the fighting on May 3rd, is at Chancellor House at the Chancellorsville Crossroads, the center of the fighting, uh, and he's leading uh, from the front. This was a hospital location, which has quickly become the battlefield itself, uh, as the Union lines are collapsing around Hooker and his command, including Letterman, uh, there at the Chancellor's, Chancellor House. A Confederate artillery round struck a porch pillar uh, that Joe Hooker was leaning against on the front porch of the Chancellor House. Uh, the pillar goes flying and takes Joseph Hooker, the army commander, with it. Hooker was knocked unconscious and many thought he was dead. He laid unconscious for, uh, for minutes um, without any response. Letterman helped the stricken general, but there was very little that could be done at this point. Uh, Hooker did eventually wake up, um, but he did not have any of its wits about him. He very likely was concussed. Problem is, in the uh, 19th century, if you don't see a wound, you can't treat it. Uh, and so a, an injury, a traumatic brain injury, is just completely entirely unknown to, to medical professionals at this time, Letterman included. And so they're, they don't have a ready explanation other than that he was struck by this and he doesn't seem to be able to get his equilibrium back. Um, and so he's in a constant state of confusion and this leads to poor battlefield leadership and ultimately helped to assure defeat at Chancellorsville. Uh, many who weren't there for the porch pillar incident striking, uh, the striking of General Hooker believed that Hooker was drunk um, and that that was the source of the confusion. And that kind of, there was already a view of Hooker that, um, that he was uh, a, a drunk, that he enjoyed his drinks. Um, but Letterman was there at the Chancellor House, witnessed the scenes that led to the general's incapacitation and was a witness to say, no, he wasn't drunk. 
but we don't know what happened. He got hit by the porch pillar, he woke up and nothing seemed to be normal. So in the chaos of the evacuation in Chancellorsville, uh, here, we have another, here we have another battle with another 10,000 wounded soldiers. So we have 10,000 more wounded to deal with. And Hooker again stands in the path of Letterman's organized evacuation uh, for these wounded. As the army retreated north, Letterman was ordered to evacuate the wounded, but was told by Hooker that traffic could only be one way. Uh, this meant that all of the wounded from the main area of combat around the Chancellor House and in the lines just to the north of it, um, numbering in the thousands, were going to need to be evacuated by relatively few ambulances that Letterman had on hand south of the river. Remember, during the battle, Hooker prevents Letterman from bringing the ambulances across the river. Uh, this means that there are only a handful of them, uh, relatively speaking, on hand to actually carry and ferry the wounded across the pontoon bridges. Um, Letterman pleads his case to Hooker and, quote, after much solicitation, Hooker granted Letterman his wish to use all of the ambulances to evacuate the wounded from uh, Chancellorsville. So he is able, again, they have a bit of a better relationship than Burnside, able to work together. In this campaign, Letterman also dealt with uh, Confederates, uh, Confederate medical department, uh, negotiating with Confederate leadership to get more than 1,200 wounded men and several of his surgeons released and sent back across the river. The negotiation didn't go well uh, until Letterman was put into contact with his Confederate counterpart. That would be Dr. Lafayette Guild of Alabama. You may, if you did catch our videos from Manassas Battlefield uh, at the end of August, you learned a little bit about Dr. Lafayette Guild. Um, as it turns out, Guild had graduated one year before Letterman at Jefferson Medical College. So Philadelphia, medical mecca, it's going to attract these personalities who are going to participate uh, both the U.S. side, Confederate side during the conflict. On May 13, 1863, after days of negotiation and suffering amongst the wounded, Letterman successfully brought out those 1,200 wounded soldiers back across the Rappahannock into Union lines. As for Hooker and Letterman, uh, the Chancellorsville campaign pretty well destroys their relationship. They, they had been getting along quite well, reforming the Army of the Potomac, trying to make sure that its men are healthy, well-fed, uh, organized, morale's improved. But now that they've been on campaign, they've been in battle together, things didn't go well. Uh, Hooker ordered the suppression of casualty numbers from the Chancellorsville campaign. Uh, Letterman could not crunch those numbers and analyze the medical department's part in the battle, nor could he uh, order supplies for the wounded. So as the army uh, armies move north, um, the Army of Northern Virginia is going to go into the Shenandoah Valley and then up into Pennsylvania, uh, medical supplies are slow to arrive for those wounded soldiers still left behind after Chancellorsville, uh, stu still being treated in the hospitals north of the Rappahannock River. Uh, and this is going to wreak havoc on the health of, of these Union soldiers. So Letterman is furious. Uh, Hooker suppresses the number of, of wounded soldiers. So they're reporting only a, you know, a relatively small fraction of those that are actually wounded at Chancellorsville and under the care of Letterman's team. And so Letterman can't report back to headquarters in Washington saying, I need this many supplies because there's only so many wounded that have been reported. So this is extremely vexing to Letterman and he can't get the supplies that he needs because of the orders of his commanding officer trying to hide this epic defeat that they all face. So as the armies begin moving north, Letterman, of course, goes with them. And so does Joe Hooker. Um, Letterman again plans to use Frederick, Maryland as a base of operations um, for the medical department of the Army of the Potomac as it ventured north towards an unknown battlefield. Uh, at Frederick, uh, the end of June 1863, Letterman also learned he had a new commander. So we're on the, the Army of the Potomac command uh, merry-go-round continues. Uh, so these two men, bon voyage to Joe Hooker, hello to George Gordon Meade. On June 28, 1863, Hooker was relieved of, of command and George Meade took his place at Frederick. Letterman now had a new commanding officer on the eve of what turned out to be the bloodiest battle of the Civil War. And things were going to immediately get pretty complicated. On one of the first things that Meade did as commander was to send the Union Army's ambulance reserve and supplies to the area of Westminster, Maryland, and ordered it to stand fast there. 
uh, medical supplies and ambulances desperately ne needed on the battlefield were ultimately going to be stranded miles uh, from uh, Gettysburg once the battle begins uh, in Westminster. This gets to keeping with uh, George Meade's idea that there was actually going to be fighting uh, uh, on the defensive in Maryland as opposed to at Gettysburg. Um, so he is preparing for battle, uh, I believe, on what's called the Pipe Creek Line, not necessarily at Gettysburg itself. So that's where that order kind of originates from. So we go to Gettysburg and I won't go too much into the, into the battle. You all know that probably better than me, honestly. Uh, so we'll keep the focus tightly on Letterman. Uh, medical department at the Battle of Gettysburg is gonna number 650 medical officers deployed among more than 225 regiments. There were also a thousand ambulances available to him. Uh, he had an ambulance corps this is important, uh, in a, a dedicated ambulance corps separate uh, from the army units themselves, separate from the regiments, the brigades, the divisions, the corps. There is a separate ambulance corps under the command of Letterman and the medical department team. Um, that is going to have 100 ambulances, 13 officers, and 350 men, 300 horses for those ambulances. As the battle raged to life on July 1st, Letterman was with General Meade. So many of the hospitals used by the Army of the Potomac on the first day were laid out by lower ranking military op medical officers, not Letterman himself, as had actually been the case in uh, all of the other previous fights. The hospitals were actually chosen by Letterman and those immediately under his supervision. That's going to be different at Gettysburg. Letterman attaches his medical headquarters to Meade's on the Tawny Town Road. Uh, for the battle. After two days of fighting, 12,000 wounded came into Letterman's control. His scattered and poorly supplied ambulance teams uh, raced over the battlefield after dark to collect the wounded. They had help from volunteers as well, uh, as the carnage on, these battlefield, on this battlefield was almost unbelievable. By July 3rd, 1863, most of Letterman's medical supplies and reinforcements were still stranded at Westminster, but assistance came in the form of the Sanitary Commission and the Christian Commission, uh, supplying the Army's medical department uh, over the course of the battle. Letterman spent the night of the second and third looking in on his hospitals, relocating some of them, and becoming angry that the holdup uh, at Westminster prevented adequate supply uh, from reaching his overcrowded hospitals. Uh, and as the fighting went on to rage, rage on on July 3rd, the bulk of Letterman's supplies still had yet to re reach the battlefield and the casualty rolls continued to rise. Uh, by the end, the US Army had lost more than 15,000 wounded at the Battle of Gettysburg. Though the supplies at Gettysburg are slow in coming in, Letterman's ambulance corps did quite an amazing job. As the battle came to a close on the third and the major combat operations failed to start again on the fourth as Confederate army retreats, Letterman lauded the efforts of his ambulance men. He said, quote, I have it from the most reliable authority in my own observation that not one wounded man was left on the field within our lines on the morning of July 4. When the Confederate army evacuated toward the Potomac River, they're going to leave behind an additional 6,000 wounded who were captured by Meade's forces and are going to be added to the list of those men needed to be cared for by the medical department of the Army of the Potomac. So you're going to have 21,000 uh, wounded soldiers in the vicinity of the uh, Gettysburg area that are going to need some medical attention. So the staggering number of wounded at Gettysburg were, were utterly overwhelming. Uh, Letterman and his team struggled under the weight of the numbers and ultimately Letterman continued to funnel supplies from Westminster to Gettysburg to help. And this is where the needs of the campaign are going to come back in. There's still an army operating north of the Potomac River at this stage and so the army of the Potomac needs to respond to that and, and go and chase down the army of northern Virginia though it's been defeated. And so Letterman, he's the medical director of the army of the Potomac. He goes with the army as it marches away on July 6th to follow Meade in the army's pursuit of Lee to the Potomac. Because of the nature of the campaign, Letterman had little chance to personally oversee the aftermath of Gettysburg. Instead, his surgeons at the Gettysburg hospitals, in many cases that he had helped to hand pick, uh, are going to take, take over and continue on where Letterman left off. Uh, Letterman chooses Henry James to place in charge of the hospitals at Gettysburg 
and Jane's began the process of consolidating scattered field hospitals and sending patients to larger facilities in northern cities. Uh, most ended up going to Philadelphia, though some end up in York, um, some end up in Harrisburg, some end up in Baltimore. Uh, as conditions at Gettysburg worsened in the weeks after the battle, though, Surgeon General Hammond forwarded more supplies and personnel to Gettysburg to help the overwhelmed medical staff there. Uh, Janes organized the long-term care facility uh, in the vicinity of the, um, of the battlefield that followed the model of what Letterman did at Smoketown Hospital after Antietam. Now, Camp Letterman was a result, and 5,000 seriously wounded patients were treated in the tents there in the weeks and months that followed the battle. So during and after the Battle of Gettysburg, it's important to recognize the work of the Sanitary Commission, the Christian Commission, and other relief organizations. Always important to throw them in here because they're doing amazing work in support of the Army Medical Department under Letterman. They're able to keep the medical department going in desperate situations, and Letterman had always placed an emphasis on utilizing support from relief organizations to help bolster the Army's response to major combat operations. This continued on with the Army of the Potomac for the rest of the conflict. So back to William Hammond here as we begin, begin to, uh, as we wrap up here, um, Letterman's situation begins to sour in the summer of 1863. Uh, his friend in the Surgeon General's office, William Hammond, was being investigated at this point, and his effective role as Surgeon General came to an end. Uh, this was due to a fraying relationship specifically between William Hammond and the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. So politics are getting in the way of the medical uh, leadership of the Civil War effort. Uh, with Letterman's main friend and advocate in trouble, Letterman sees trouble brewing. Um, and go back here to Meade, comes floating back in. After Gettysburg, Letterman and Meade worked together to make their ambulance corps more official, giving it military roles, responsibilities, mandating training, uh, uniforms are coming in, keeping military order over this ambulance corps. With this and subsequent rules and regulations put in place in the fall of 1863, Letterman began to feel that his mission was complete. Letterman was a bachelor, married, uh, he was a bachelor for most of his Civil War service, uh, he gets married in the fall of 1863 and began to set his sights on other endeavors. Um, he met uh, his wife um, in uh, Maryland, uh, actually after the Battle of Antietam in October of 1862. Uh, they get married in October of 1863. Uh, and so on December 30th, 1863, Letterman steps away from the job as medical director of the Army of the Potomac. He leaves the Army of the Potomac um, and is going to be stationed uh, in Pennsylvania uh, in the aftermath of his, his leaving the Army of the Potomac. So Letterman, in this case, goes away. And he's going to be replaced by a uh, gentleman over here on the right. We kind of flop, flip flop there. We have George Meade on the left, Thomas McParlin on the right, one of my favorite figures from the war that I'm sure most of you have probably never heard of. He's going to be Letterman's replacement at the, as the medical director of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, he's going to remain uh, in that post for most of the remainder of the conflict. Uh, McParlin had the job of continuing Letterman's legacy uh, and continuing the work of reforming and, and creating a modern battlefield evacuation system uh, in the brutal conditions that are going to face the Army in 1864. Uh, McParlin is going to take that system, take the Letterman system that we've talked about at some length, uh, into the bloodiest campaign of the war uh, between the wilderness and Petersburg, known as the Overland Campaign in May and June of 1864. And the Letterman system continued to prove its effectiveness under trying battlefield circumstances. These uh, thus laying a groundwork of a evacuate, an evacuation system that was going to prove itself effective in a military setting, but also in civilian aspects as well. In March of 1864, Congress passed the Ambulance Corps Act that mandated the U.S. Army have part of its organization specifically geared toward evacuating the, uh, evacuating the wounded from the battlefield. This included not only the Army of the Potomac, but the entirety of the U.S. Army. So the Letterman Plan is instilled over the entirety of the U.S. Army, not just the 100,000 or so men of the Army of the Potomac. The Letterman Plan had become the official policy of the U.S. government enshrined in American law. 
The system would be used on the battlefield for the remainder of the war and into the post-war years. It actually became the basis of ambulance units and evacuation systems used by armies across the world in the later part of the 19th century and up, up to World War I as well. Uh, in fact, that system ends up having to sort of be taught back to the US Army when we go to war in 1917 and 1918 in Europe as part of World War I. Uh, we had to learn that system back. Uh, from those who had adapted the Letterman system for their purpose in the years after the Civil War uh, by the armies of England, France, um, and the Germans themselves, the Prussian army, uh, used uh, an adaptation of Letterman system they called the American plan uh, during the 19th century. So after leaving the Army of the Potomac, Letterman goes uh, on to become a hospital inspector in the department of the Susquehanna in Pennsylvania. Uh, he had a had time to be with his wife and begin to prepare for a life after the army, which is the only career he had ever known. He resigned from the US Army at the end of 1864, moved to California, and ultimately failed as an oil man working for Pennsylvania Railroad executive Thomas Scott. He and his wife settled in San Francisco where they spent the, uh, the remainder of their unfortunately short lives. Um, Letterman published his memoirs, as you can see here. Uh, this is an amazing read available at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. You can also find it online um, in digital form um, in, in numerous places. Uh, Letterman published these memoirs, The Medical Recollections of the Army of the Potomac in 1866, and then became the elected coroner in San Francisco. Um, unfortunately, uh, his life and the life of his wife are, are gonna be pretty short. Um, Letterman, Letterman's wife died at the age of 38 in 1867. Uh, Letterman followed her shortly uh, in death in 1872. He was only 47. Uh, their remains were brought to Arlington National Cemetery where they reside beneath this beautiful monument. Uh, and though his role has mostly been forgotten by, by most Americans, unfortunately, we are doing our best to restore the reputation uh, and uh, to tell the story of Jonathan Letterman at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, he is remembered, those who do remember him know him as the father of modern battlefield medicine. Uh, and ultimately, uh, many of those that served with him during the Civil War do put this incredible, um, incredible uh, epitaph on his grave, um, talking about bringing order and efficiency to the medical service uh, and an originator of modern methods of medical organization in armies. So go back to these terms here, you know, what, what makes a leader? What makes an innovator? When we look at Letterman's life and his career with the Army of the Potomac, we can see these, these four themes start to crop up. His ability to work with his colleagues, his ability to work with the Surgeon General, with his commanders, the rapport he was able to build in some cases when he had an opportunity to build a relationship that wasn't thrown into battle uh, with, with these generals just days before the fighting was to take place. He is able to collaborate. He and William Hammond specifically, their collaboration is vitally important to understanding medical care during the Civil War. They were able to, to do some incredible things to bring about real meaningful change that ultimately saved untold thousands of lives during the war. Innovation, taking these new ideas, putting them into practice, uh, trying new things, testing them out, creating these systems, thinking about them as systems and not as individual pieces, but as, as a whole and how those pieces fit into the whole and how they can work better together by thinking of them as this, as this entire system. Not just thinking about a, a field dressing station and where we're gonna put one of those, but thinking about all the field dressing stations and how they're gonna communicate with the field hospitals and how the field hospitals are gonna to connect to the larger hospitals back in the major cities. Communication, the ability to, to communicate both with superiors, but also with those uh, who are serving uh, under him, who are, who are serving Letterman himself. Uh, being able to communicate his wishes, being able to communicate uh, what he is thinking, communicating orders, but also communicating uh, his ideas about what he was trying to put in place. It, when, you, when you go and you read the medical recollections, you'll find a very analytical man. You'll, you won't find a lot of color. You won't find a lot of, 
of opinion. You won't find a lot of his thoughts about the war. What you'll find is that he was supremely focused. And he's also a really great communicator, a good writer that is able to take very large sets of numbers in many cases and make some sense out of them. And ultimately, what is important for all of us, adaptation, to be able to change. His plans always had to change because battle necessitates it. Just like command, a commander's decisions and his plans doesn't survive, don't survive contact with the enemy. A medical plan doesn't, does the same thing. You can't rely on that plan to, to work perfectly because of the circumstances of the battlefield. And so those adaptations, we can see Letterman uh, making those adaptations and ultimately continuing to, to kind of fulfill his plan. So I think when we look at Jonathan Letterman, we look at his career, we look at his life, these four themes jumped out at me. Um, and they are things that we can take away. We can learn lessons from Letterman. We can read more about him. We can uh, understand what he and his comrades uh, and his colleagues were able to do. And that we can actually take that information and apply it today. I often work with modern military medical professionals and, and I, I talk about Letterman and we talk about what he did uh, oftentimes at Antietam. And I'm always amazed, always consistently amazed by telling this story, how they are able to make connections. And they say, oh, wow, 155 years ago, he's facing some of the same things I'm facing today. Though, they, though he was doing this work more than a century and a half ago, there are universals that we can take away. Universals about, about medicine, universals about, about chaos, about war, but also about leadership, about things that we can put into place in our own lives today. So I wanna thank you all for tuning in with me uh, today. I uh, hope you have enjoyed this program. Um, I'm gonna stop my screen share there and, and jump over here. All right. Um, so I hope you all have enjoyed enjoyed that program today. And so we still have 40 people here, which is awesome. Um, so take a look here at the comments and start from the, I know I should probably start from the top, but I'm, I'm starting from the, the, the latest comments here. So did uh, General Grant continue a robust relationship with the Union Medical Corps after Letterman? This is a great question. I actually do a presentation um, called After Letterman, which is all about Thomas McParland. I guess that. I'm a pretty, pretty big fan of Thomas McParland. Um, there's going to be a pretty good relationship eventually established. That relationship did not start off on a great foot. Uh, so first major battle in the East that Grant is going to oversee at the wilderness. Uh, Grant's battlefield strategy in conjunction with Meade. There is an original medical response plan. That plan is thrown out very quickly, and this means adaptation is going to be required throughout the rest of the campaign, and, and it didn't always go very well. So they started off badly. Uh, ultimately, after that point, things do begin to, to get better, especially when they get to Petersburg. Uh, the Army Medical Department's response at Petersburg, because the Army lines are it's going to be so kind of stagnant and steady, it's going to be a easier to get medical supplies to the front and to create an organized and very effective battlefield evacuation plan that oftentimes included railroads um, right from the start, right behind Union lines at Petersburg. So that relationship is going to get a lot better. Uh, it does start off pretty rocky, though. Um, hope, that, hope that answers your question here. So I'm going back through. Um, did the armies in the Confederacy adapt any of these progressive ways of managing injur the injured um, as they learned of them? Uh, that is a great question, Debbie. Unfortunately, Confederate Army is going to be facing a lot of the, for, for them, a lot of logistical challenges that are gonna make a lot of what Letterman did kind of unattainable for them. Um, one of them being the lack of ambulances. Uh, so the Union Army is gonna be constructing ambulances. They're gonna be using wagons of all sorts. Uh, Northern uh, side of this conflict is going to have quite an industrial, uh, advantage over their Confederate foes. And so they are able to manufacture ambulances at very, very quickly, very effectively. Confederacy doesn't have, have that kind of capability. So many of the ambulances that they're going to use are going to be uh, 
be what they can get from the army when from the army of the Potomac or the other US armies when they capture them. Uh, so same with a lot of the medical supplies as well. So there's not a lot of um, opportunity to, to put in place a lot of what Letterman did. They did the best with what they could and, and they're going to struggle to create an ambulance system. Um, my, myself, my colleague, Kyle Dalton, uh, in a couple of weeks here, we're actually gonna talk about, about ambulances in both the Union and the Confederate Army. And we'll talk about the Ambulance Corps and the Confederate Army. Uh, but there wasn't the same organizational push that Letterman put in place and the same kinds of systems uh, didn't get put in place on the Confederate side. Keep coming up here. How quickly did the Letterman system translate to the Western theater? Any innovative equivalents of doctors thereof? Uh, Dr. Um, Bernard Irwin at Shiloh developing a tent field hospital. Great question, Lynn. Uh, this is very, uh, it, it's very relative based on the army um, that you're looking at in the Western theater. Um, the, the armies themselves had very distinct personalities and this also reflected the medical side as well. Uh, what you'll see is uh, the armies that had a more effective supply chain and, and were more connected to their bases, had better medical responses and were more like the Army of the Potomac. Then when you look at like William Sherman, uh, when he when he's marching to the sea and they cut ties with, with Union lines behind them, they have to kind of adapt as they go. And so the Letterman system doesn't always apply as well in the Western theater, though because of the Ambulance Act in 1864, they are required to have an ambulance corps within those armies how effectively they were able to work, um, especially without a steady hand at the wheel like Letterman was, like Thomas McParlin was, um, you know, it really varied from army to army. Um, but those systems uh, were adapted pretty quickly because they were, they had to be adapted quickly um, in 1864. Prior to that, it is much more scattershot. Again, you have to look at each army uh, to kind of understand. Um, from Mike, at Antietam, were Confederate wounded afforded the same level of care that Union soldiers were? Uh, this is actually, this is a really common question we get, Mike, at the, at the Civil War Medicine Museum because Frederick, uh, where the museum is located, did become that kind of transit hospital, 8,000 patients being treated there uh, at Frederick. Many of them were Confederates, uh, most of whom were captured either, um, most of them actually were captured at the Sunken Road, the Bloody Lane at Antietam. And uh, William Hammond comes to Frederick shortly after the Battle of Antietam, and he is going to issue a circular to uh, the army there, the forces operating uh, and the medical personnel operating at Frederick, that those wounded uh, Union and Confederate had to be given the same care, be cared for in the same hospitals, be given equal treatment. Um, that is in 1862, there's pretty well a, a, an unwritten code between these armies um, that goes back to the Winchester Accords in, in early 1862 that there was some care given. Was it the same adequate care as, you know, say Union, Union surgeon giving a Confederate captured soldier? Um, you, you know, same with the Confederates to, to a uh, captured Union soldier who may have been wounded. Uh, it definitely varies. Um, there's no universal to say that, yes, they were able, they were cared for, um, given absolutely equal treatment. I, I think that's pretty unlikely. Um, it's kind of on an individual by individual base. Um, but by 1863 and 1864, those systems really begin to break down, especially when the US Army begins bringing on um, African-American soldiers. Um, and then we're dealing with a, a whole other um, situation begins to develop um, where in some cases wounded, wounded soldiers uh, can be killed. Uh, there's massacres and murders and, and things really begin to break down by, especially by 1864. All right, everybody, I want to thank you all so much. Thanks for the great questions. I uh, appreciate you all tuning in. If you did enjoy the program today, uh, please consider becoming a member of the museum. Uh, Civilwarmed.org slash support uh, is where you would be able to find that. And uh, I hope you all have a great day. Uh, thanks for sticking with me for this long program. And uh, uh, we'll see you on Thursday at Antietam National Battlefield for our next program. Thank you all so much.